God sent an angel to visit Mary, and the angel said, Mary, you have nothing to fear, for God has a surprise for you, and his name will be Jesus. Well, hello, Radiant Church. We want to take a moment and welcome those of you who are joining us online this weekend and those of you over at Portage. Come on, everybody who's in the house, can we put our hands together and welcome the rest of our family? The rest of our family spread out in thousands of locations, not only here, but around the country, multiple different states. Uh, last weekend, I was in Kansas City, Missouri. I was ministering in a church that's part of our Radiant Network of churches and uh, then visited some friends on the Kansas side. And I was in a restaurant with a, a friend of mine. Yes, in Kansas, restaurants are open. And so we were there eating and somebody who walked in was part of the International House of Prayer or otherwise known as IHOP. And they walked in and they go, are you Lee Cummings? And I said, yeah. And they go, oh, you're the pastor of the church where Caleb Culver is a worship leader. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, that's right. That's that's right. So uh, we're impacting people all over, and uh, you're making a difference. And so those of you who are joining us online, we welcome you today. Turn with me in your Bibles if you have them. And even at home, I would encourage you to open your Bibles with me to Luke chapter 1. In Luke chapter 1, we're going to begin this weekend this emphasis on the message of Christmas. And I've entitled the next few messages leading up towards Christmas Mary's miracle. We're going to be looking at the story of the incarnation, the coming of Jesus through the lens of the mother of Jesus, a young woman whose name is Mary. And the title of this first message is The Problem with Favor. The Problem with Favor. Look with me here at Luke chapter 1. We're going to begin in verse number 26. And it says, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and trying to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Verse 34, Mary said to the angel, how will this be since I am a virgin? And the angel said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. This is the beginning of what we know and what we're celebrating in this season as the Christmas miracle. Another way of describing it throughout the years of church history is Advent. Advent is a word that means the coming or the appearing. And this is the time of year where we reflect and we focus on the coming of the Messiah, the coming of Jesus. Not just the birth of a child. Lots of children are born in lots of different places. And on every continent and every city, there's, there's an ongoing birth rate. But what we're focusing on is not the birth rate or the birth of just any child. We're looking at the miracle of God becoming a man. God himself stepping out of eternity into this thing that he created called history. 
in order through his life and ultimately his death, his burial, and his resurrection to bring about salvation for eternity. For those who all of their lives and for the very millennia of existence since the fall in the garden have been slaves to sin and destined for death and separation. And this is the beginning of that story. It starts with a young woman named Mary. I mean, we think about Mary because if you've grown up in church and depending on your denominational background, Mary holds varying different degrees of honor and veneration. The one thing that we can all agree on is that this was an incredible woman of faith. This was a woman who was at a point in her life, a young woman who's at a point in her life where the Bible describes her right here and what we just read as she was betrothed. That's not a word that we commonly use in our English language because kind of how things go in our culture is, you know, people date, figure out if they like one another, and then, you know, somebody pops the question and asks, will you marry me? That, by the way, just happened in our family. Our youngest daughter, Tiffany, just got engaged about a week ago. We, Jane and I knew for weeks what was coming, and Ashley, her older sister, knew what was coming, and we had to lie through our teeth to keep it a secret because she's an investigative mind. She's, she has the gift of suspicion, and so we had to ask for a special dispensation from God so that we could lie to her about events that were about to take place because we knew that her fiancé had a whole process all lined up to proposed to her. And so he proposed to her, you know, he got down on one knee, asked her, will you marry me? And then from that point, you go on through a period of time called uh, engagement up until the big day of marriage. That's kind of how it goes. But it was different in, their, in, in the times of Jesus in the time that Mary finds herself betrothed. That word betrothed means at whatever point families decide that their daughter is going to marry somebody else. And oftentimes it was arranged marriages. They would go through a process of vetting, the family would, and then there would be a betrothal. And the betrothal basically was a legal marriage has begun. When you got betrothed, betrothed, it was more than an engagement. You in the eyes of the community were married. You just had not consummated the marriage yet. There was a preparation time in which the husband would prepare the home. He'd prepare the, the finances. The dowry would be exchanged. Contracts would be. There would be due diligence that took place. And then there would come a time where the, the groom would come and take the bride to himself, into their home, and then there would be the consummation of the marriage. They would not know one another in a biblical sense until they were living under the same roof, even though legally they were married. And if you wanted to break the engagement, it wasn't just giving your ring back, it was actually a legal divorce. So this is serious stuff. Mary finds herself betrothed, more than engaged, not quite fully married yet. And I want you to think about this, that this young lady is focusing and thinking about her whole future. She's thinking about their house. She's registering at Bed Bath and Beyond. I mean, she's thinking about, hey, we're going to have a family. Probably, in most, in most likelihood, Joseph is significantly older than she is. She's probably... Just from what we know, the customs of the first century, she's probably in her mid-teens. And Joseph is probably late 20s, early 30s. And she's dreaming about being married to her husband. She's dreaming about the ceremony when he will one day come and he will take his bride and the community will come out and celebrate their union and I mean, there, it was a celebration that went on for sometimes multiple days. She's dreaming about that, dreaming about her home, dreaming about her future. All of those things that a young lady who's about to get married dreams of. And then, angel of the Lord shows up. Gabriel. Gabriel is no insignificant angel. He's a messenger from the very presence of God. The last time we've heard of Gabriel in scriptures in the book of Daniel when Daniel is in exile 
and he's praying and he's fasting and he's asking God to get clarity about the purposes that and the promises that he has for Israel to bring them out of Babylon, bring them back into the land. Gabriel's the one that shows up and downloads God's eternal purposes, his purposes and his timeline for bringing them back out of exile, for fulfilling the promises to deliver the Messiah to the nation of Israel to save them from their sins, to tie up all the loose ends, and to establish his eternal kingdom on the earth. I mean, Gabriel is an emissary from the presence of God. And he's not showing up to Daniel the prophet. He's showing up to Mary, this young, developing, betrothed, insignificant in the world's eyes but not at all insignificant in heaven's eyes. And he says to her, think about this. I love this salutation. He says, greetings, O favored one. The Lord is with you. Greetings, O favored one. That word favor is a big part of the story surrounding Mary believing God about the birth of Jesus. You find it a couple verses down later. It says, you have found favor with God. In verse number 30, you have found favor with God. You see, in our modern American vernacular, especially in our American Christian way of thinking, the word favor has oftentimes been used and hijacked for all the wrong reasons. I did a little Google search and on Amazon or Google search and then Amazon and look up all the Christian books that have been written on favor, the idea of favor. And we've got all these little sayings. By the way, there's hundreds of books. The Force of Favor, The Fuel of Favor. Favor ain't fair, but it sure feels good. I mean, there's all kinds of books, sermons, periodicals, cliches that as Christians we talk about favor. But I don't think that we fully understood the problem of favor. Because when we think about favor, we think about God coming and giving us, it's kind of like we found the golden ticket and now God's gonna do for us whatever we want. I got favor with God and so I wanna use it for myself. I wanna use it for my desires. I wanna use it for my dreams. It's a force that I can somehow bend the will of God to do for me what he won't do for somebody else. But there's a problem with favor. And the problem with favor is that we've completely misunderstood it. The problem with favor is not God. The problem with favor is us. Because we've seen it as a tool or a mechanism in order to get something, to get favored, quote, favored status. And we haven't understood that favor is always connected to God's purposes. Look at Mary's life here, and what we realize is when the angel comes and announces to her, you found favor in the sight of God. Now he begins to describe and download the implications of favor. Because if I were to ask you, wherever you're at, even at home, wherever you're at right now, what, do you want to walk in the favor of God? How many of you would raise your hand and say, yeah, I want the favor of God on my life? Raise your hand if you would like the favor of God on your life. Okay, let me describe to you what favor does before you raise your hand. Because favor is good, but it may be different than what you think. So let me, let me share with you some thoughts about favor. Number one, the word favor comes from the same root word that we get grace and blessing. Charis, it, it's the same root word. And when we talk about grace, grace oftentimes is connected with salvation. So what is grace? Grace, I define grace this way. Grace is God's saving response to a sinner's faith-filled inability. Well, describe that for me. It's God's response. God responding to sinners who are unable to help themselves, but exercise faith in what Jesus has done on the cross. That's faith. We don't have the ability to save ourselves. God's response to that kind of faith is salvation. That's grace. We are saved by grace through faith. That's, that's right out of Ephesians chapter two. That's grace, but what is favor? Here's what favor is. Favor being very similar 
Instead of it dealing with the sinner, it deals with the saint. Favor is God's response to the saint's faith-filled availability. Not our inability, but our availability. When we look at Mary, why does the angel pick this young lady? Why does he find her address in the middle of a small town in the Middle East, in a nowhere country, a teenager who's about to get married that you don't hear any fanfare about. Rome's not talking about it. Alexandria, Egypt's not talking about it. Scripture hasn't even listed her. She's just, in the world's perspective, she's just a insignificant nobody. But yet heaven has zeroed in on her. Why has heaven, why has God's eye and God's power and his favor, which is his supernatural goodness and kindness, biased towards an individual. Why has it found Mary? It's because he saw something in her. He saw purity. He saw holiness. He saw availability. A heart that had been fully turned towards God. Not for what he, she could get from God, but a heart that was totally devoted to the Lord, to his word. How do we know that? I mean, next week I'll talk a little bit more about this. But when you read about what's called the Magnificat, which is her song and her prayer, it's mostly scripture from Hannah out of the Old Testament. What does that tell us? It means in the moment of her greatest confrontation with the goodness and the impossibility of God's calling on her life, scripture and songs and psalms that she had all of her life memorized is what comes out of her heart. What does that mean? I mean, she's a young lady that even though the world didn't see her, heaven saw her because God always releases favor upon the available. Upon those who are divinely available. It's interesting that in 2 Timothy chapter 2, Paul talks about being vessels of honor. That all of us, in a great house, there are both common vessels and there are special vessels. And he says this, he says in 2 Timothy chapter two, he says, therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable or what is common, he will become a vessel for honorable use. Here's a key word, set apart as holy, useful to the master, ready for every good work. See, oftentimes, here's the reality. Salvation is free. You don't have to pay for it. You don't have to earn it. Jesus already paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. How many are grateful for the free gift of salvation that Jesus offers you? You grateful for that? Great. Let me tell you something. Salvation is free. Destiny will cost you everything. What do I mean by destiny? I mean exactly what Paul writes in 2 Timothy chapter 2. Becoming a vessel of honor that becomes useful in the master's hands requires a decision of preparing ourselves and making ourselves available. We don't know all the backstory, but what we do know is that's how God operates. That's what favor is attracted to, and that's who Mary was. Mary's whole story wouldn't make sense until the day that she sees Jesus resurrected from the dead. She pondered many of these things in her heart and in her mind throughout the 30 plus years that she mothered this Messiah, this God become man. I mean, imagine parenting God. I mean, it's kind of nice because he never loses his temper and steals from his siblings, but he knows way more than you do. And when you say, because I said so. God turned around and says, but actually because I said so. <laughs> but there are things in raising Jesus. The Bible says that not only did Mary find favor, think about this, even Jesus, it says, grew in favor, wisdom, and stature with God and man. So she watched this whole development. But she became one that the favor of God was upon. And what we learn about favor, let me, from just this story that we just read, let me share with you three things that, we've, that we see about favor here that's, that's important for us to understand so we don't run into the problem 
of favor on our life, misunderstanding what favor really is and how it works. Number one is, I'm, I'm just gonna use this, this phrase three different times. Favored are you, dot, 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 here we go. Favored are you when God graciously interrupts your plans and invites you into his. Favored are you. That's what happened with Mary. Mary has her plans. Mary has her, however many months it's gonna be before Joseph comes and takes her and they begin to build a family. She's got her dreams of her family, extended family, all gathering together of festivities. She's got plans of getting pregnant, of decorating the nursery. She's got plans of how many kids they're gonna have down the road. All of that in a moment gets interrupted when the angel of the Lord shows up and announces favor. See, we think sometimes that if I could just get God's favor, I could get heaven's power to become the wind and the sails of my desires. If I could just get God to breathe on what my plans for my future are, that would be favor. But actually the opposite happens. Favor is actually the interjection of God's goodness and kindness into your life in such a way that it interrupts the earthly plans and strategies and goals that you've made and God steps in and says, I wanna use you for my plans. And because you're favored, I'm gonna let you in on what I'm not letting anybody else in on. I'm gonna let you in on my purposes and my plans, but it's gonna cost you. Here's what it cost Mary. Dignity. Because all of her life, there would be people that would look at her and think, yeah, we know all about her story. An angel showed up. And she just miraculously had this child. How do we know that? Because even in the, the stories of Jesus, we find out that when he comes back to his own hometown, there are some people who basically question whether he was legitimate or not. Mary had to live with the stigma of that. She had to trust God with Joseph. Because how many know that that conversation had to be interesting? Joseph, I'm pregnant. How? Because I know I wasn't there. Well, the angel of the Lord. Oh, 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 here we go. Angel of the Lord. I mean, she had to tell the whole story. And what we know is that it took another angelic visitation to convince Joseph not to divorce her. Now, Joseph was a good man, but I'm telling you that I don't know too many guys who if their girlfriend came pregnant to them and told them a story about an angel and about the Holy Spirit and about eternity and about the Messiah and changing the world and the whole thing. And that's why I'm, I don't know a whole lot of people who are going, oh yeah, that makes perfect sense. Totally understand it. Now, she had to, she had to trust God's interruption. How many have ever had your plans interrupted by God's plans? It's in those moments that we don't typically think this is God's favor. But it actually is. It's actually gracious of God to not just let our plans run their course. Our plans produce our results. But when God inter interrupts and intersects his purposes and plans, even though we don't know the whole story, she did not know the whole story. Even though there was a great cost of sacrifice, of things that she had to put on the altar, what if Joseph doesn't marry me? What if my family disowns me? I could be stoned for adultery as I grow more pronounced and more pregnant. They could literally, legally take her out in the streets and stone her. She had to count all of that cost as now the angel of the Lord is showing up in her life and telling her that you have found favor in the sight of God. Favored are you when God graciously interrupts your plans and invites you into his. Number two, favored are you when you have to wrestle with what God is speaking to you in order to find clarity. 
I have found that clarity concerning the purposes and the plans of God for our lives don't often come immediately. I've had people say, you know, I just want God to tell me what my purpose and my plan is for my life. And what we expect God to do is roll out the blueprints on the table and say, here's you at five, and here's you at 95. You're gonna live 95 years in four months, and you're gonna meet this person, you're gonna marry them, you're gonna have 2.5 kids. I don't know where the other .5 went, but you get 2.5 kids, and you're gonna you know, make this impact, and <coughs> your hair's gonna go gray at this age, and this is the career that I want you to go into, and this is the degree that I want you to have, and <coughs> you're gonna change the world, and, and, blah, blah, blah. and we want it all rolled out at once. That's not typically how it happens. Typically what happens is God gives us a direction, God positions us by interruption, and then we have to wrestle with what he's spoken to us to get clarity. This is what Mary has to do. It says, after the announcement, it says, she was greatly troubled and saying, at the saying, and trying to discern. That word to discern literally means to wrestle. She's wrestling with what sort of greeting this is. Have you ever had somebody greet you and you're trying to figure out, are you for me or are you against me? Are you happy with me? It's like, uh, how many know text messaging doesn't have emotion connected to it? Anybody figure that out yet? So Jane and I, we text like everybody texts. And it's taken me a while to figure out that fine doesn't mean fine. <laughs> Anybody know what I'm talking about? So I'll ask her, hey, do you mind if I go, you know, with so-and-so, I'll be a couple hours late. She used to say, fine. And I'd be like, oh, we're good. And then I'd show up, and then I began to realize, no, fine doesn't mean fine. That would have been okay with a smiley face and an exclamation point. Fine means you'll get away with it, but you're going to pay for it. And the same with a greeting. When you meet somebody and they see you, sometimes you have to look at the body language. You have to study. It's more than just the words. Somebody says, hey, good to see you. And then you're looking at them and you're doing the math going, is it really good to see me? Are you happy to see me? Or is that just, when you ask somebody, how are you doing? Do you really want to know how they're doing? Or are you just kind of saying, hey, how are you doing? So that I can get by you. Mary is wrestling with, what does this mean? What does it mean that an angel is greeting me and telling me that I'm favored? And then what, what do I have, what does this mean that the angel says to her, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. What do I need to be afraid of? It says, you have found favor with God. And then he begins to break it down. You're going to conceive in your womb. A child, the Holy Spirit's going to come upon you, overshadow you. This is language of new creation. Because in the very beginning of the Bible, in Genesis chapter 1, when God said words, let there be light, the light was, it says, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the darkness. And when God was speaking separation of land from sea and darkness from light, the Holy Spirit was over the face of the deep, activating and bringing to pass what God was speaking. That word abiding over the face of the deep is a picture, it's a word picture in Hebrew that means like a chick, a chicken, a hen over her nest incubating her eggs. And just like when, the, when God was speaking, let there be light, he had in his heart a picture of what creation was gonna look like. Mountains, oceans, stars, sun, day, night, birds, fish, creeping things, man, trees, herbs of the field. He had it in his heart even before it became a reality. Who initiated it and brought it to pass was the Holy Spirit. In the same way as he spoke to Mary about the Holy Spirit overshadowing her, he was overshadowing the darkness and the emptiness of her womb, and he was about to impregnate her with the literal eternal word of God. And even though she didn't understand how these things were going to happen, it was the word of God spoken over her that she received that actually began to develop in the darkest places of her soul and in her womb. The word began to take on flesh. 
She didn't have to understand how it was going to happen. It would come to fruition the same way creation would come into fruition. All she had to trust is even before I see it, I know that he has a design for it. I just have to trust him. But in the process, Mary was wrestling with what do these words mean? When's the last time God spoke something to you and you had to wrestle it to the ground? It's like, what does this mean, God? Is this good or is this bad? Lord, what, what are you doing? What are you saying? I don't understand. I'm trying to discern. Why are you, why are you telling me to go in this direction? You know, uh, in 2009, years ago, God had spoken to me about us having another campus on the other side of town. And so many, some of you may remember this. In 2009, we rented a school on the other side of town. We started having church on Sundays there. We recorded uh, pastor John was the campus pastor over there. We had a, about 150, 200 people that were over there. And we did it based on a word from God. We were trying to figure it all out. After about nine months, we figured out this isn't working the way that we wanted it to work. And so we had to pull it all back in. And I will tell you that I wrestled with that. I wrestled with it because, number one, I never, ever want to lead our church in a direction that's just my plan. I want to lead in conjunction with the Holy Spirit. And I felt like I had a word from God. But when it didn't pan out the way that I thought it was going to, I had to wrestle with that. God, what did you mean when you told us to go to the other side? What, did, what, is, that, what is with that word? I don't understand the timing of it. It doesn't make sense. And it wasn't until a few years later, many of you maybe have never heard this story, but in 2016, in September, I was doing a vision weekend where I was casting vision for where we were going in the next year. And I had said over from 2010 all the way up to there, every year, I talked about we're going to plant a, a radiant campus on the other side of Kalamazoo. But we looked at buildings, we, we had tried it, it didn't work, we pulled back, we kept praying, kept leaning into it, and every year I would cast that vision. This September in, in 2016, I was writing up my notes, and I had it on, I had a kind of light item there, we're going to the other side, and I actually deleted it out of my notes. Here's why I did it. I'm sick and tired of saying this is going to happen, and it's not happening. We tried it, and it didn't work. And I've wrestled with this, and I don't want to throw it out there and have another year go by that it doesn't happen. And I specifically heard the voice of the Holy Spirit saying, trust me, talk about going to the other side. I put it back in my notes. Now, unbeknownst to me, when I preached that, and I got to that point, on the other side of town was a group of elders in a struggling church that were in a leadership crisis watching that message and when they heard me say that, they all collectively, and several of them are now part of Radiant, they thought to themselves, we have a building with no leader. They have leadership and vision with no building, and they reached out to us. And within the next couple of months, it became an adoption of a struggling church, the renovation of a campus. It's now our Portage campus. On our opening Sunday in April of 2017, we had 2,300 people show up in that campus. And God's word came to pass. Thank you. That was a golf clap. All the, uh, I know all the, listen, I know all the Portage people are clapping right now. Thank you by faith. But for years I wrestled with that word. What does this mean? Favor upon your life doesn't mean that you have all the answers. It actually means you're going to have more to wrestle with. More to believe for. More to figure out because to whom much is given, much is required. Let me give you number three. Favored are you when your faith in who is with you is greater than what you are missing. Favored are you when your faith, when your trust in who is with you is greater than what you are missing. What was she missing? How can these things be? I hear what you're saying to me, God, but how can they 
come to pass, I'm a virgin. I've not been with a man. I've been through sex edge class. And I know that that's a requirement in order for there to be conception. I don't understand how this is going to happen. It's an impossibility. What does the angel say though? The angel says, things with God that seem impossible to man, all things are possible with God. Nothing shall be impossible with God. Because it's the presence of God factor. When you go all the way back to the beginning of the conversation between Gabriel and Mary, notice what he says about favor. He says, oh, favored one, what's the second part? The Lord is with you. See, the X factor in all of our lives is not what we think is possible. It's not what we know we can accomplish in and of our own strength. It boils down to, do we have faith and do we have trust in the one who said that I am with you and I will never leave you and I will never forsake you. When the presence of God and the favor of God is with you, impossibilities become probabilities. Even when we don't understand the whole story. Mary had no idea about the whole story. You know, let me tell you something. You don't know the whole story. You don't know your whole story. I don't know your story. But I know this. Hebrews chapter 12 says, keeping our eyes or fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Jesus, his presence in our life is the anchor of our soul and the anchor of our hope. I don't need to know. I don't, if I put my fixation on the things I don't have, how can this be? I've, I'm a virgin. How can this be? I don't know anybody. How can this be? It's an impossibility scientifically. How can this be? There's no jobs in my market. How can this be? My husband told me it's over and he doesn't love me anymore. How can this be? I've tried five, six, seven times and nothing's happened. And now I feel the nudge from the Lord to trust him and to believe him again. Favored are you. When favor shows up, faith in who is with you in the face of impossibilities is greater than your focus on the things that you don't have, than what you're missing, than what you're lacking. If Jesus is the author and the finisher of our faith, here's what I know about the story he's writing over our lives. He's told us the beginning, which is where Jesus finds us and saves us. And we know what the end of the story is. Safely, forever, in his presence, in his kingdom, but what is written in between, you're gonna to have to walk out the story. But here's the good news. He's the author, and Jesus writes blockbusters. Jesus writes stories that when you read them, you think you know what the characters, you think you know what the plot line, you think you know what the crisis is going to be, but Jesus has this way of in the middle of the story flipping the script and taking impossibilities and making them probabilities, about taking decisions and divinely reversing them, about making nobody somebodies, about taking forgotten, left behind, overlooked, insignificant people who will make their lives available to him because they trust in his presence and using them to save the world. One of my favorite scriptures in the New Testament relating to the birth of Jesus is Galatians 4.4. 4. In Galatians 4.4, 4, it says, in the fullness of time, at the perfect moment in history, God sent his son, born of a woman. Mary would have never guessed growing up, hey, guess what? When, what are you gonna do when you grow up? 
I'm going to partner with the God of heaven in fulfilling Isaiah 7, 14 and bringing forth the birth of the Messiah who will go to the cross, die for the sins of the world, redeem humanity back to the Father, and I'm going to be there on Pentecost Sunday when God pours out his spirit in fulfillment of Joel chapter 2, and I'm going to live in Ephesus with the Apostle John, and I'm going to watch my son grow up to be the Savior of the world. She could have never flipped it. She could have never figured out that story. And let me tell you something. You can't figure out yours. All you can do is respond like Mary did. And here's the last thing I'll leave with you. Her response in all of this, let it be done to me according to your word. You know what she was saying? Here's my life. Write whatever story you want to. With the ink of your favor upon the parchment of my availability. I trust you, Jesus, as the beginning and the end, the first and the last, the author and the finisher. I want to invite you to stand with me today, wherever you're at. I believe with all of my heart that God has declared favor over our lives. If we mistake favor as a commodity that we can use for our own desires, we might get some instant gratification, but we will miss the eternal purposes of God for our lives. Right now, if you think to yourself, God could never use me. I mean, Mary, that's Mary. God could never use me. With men, some things are impossible. With God, all things are possible. What if our response to the Lord, to his favor on our lives was, God, I may not know everything. I, I've got things that are missing. I know that there's impossibilities, but I give you my yes. I want to be set apart as a vessel of honor, and I'm saying, let it be to me according to your word, your purpose in my life. Your purpose, no reserve, no retreat, and no regret. I give you it all. Would you bow your heads with me? Lord Jesus, today, we're so in awe of the fact that you are Emmanuel, the God who is with us. Lord, you are with us. Right now, at this moment, you are with us. To the single woman who's at home and feels all alone, isolated, and the only visitor that you've had is fear. I proclaim over you that you are not alone. He is with you. To the elderly person who's at home right now, hasn't seen your family because of the pandemic and all the restrictions that have been placed on you, I want you to know that nothing can keep Jesus from socially distancing from you. Today, I proclaim over your life, Jesus is with you. To the family who's watching in their living rooms and on the horizons, there's more questions than there are answers. What does 2021 look like? What does next week look like? I may not know the answers, but I know the one who is with you. He is with you today. And he's the author, and he is the finisher of your story. Lord Jesus, would you give us not just your favor, but would you give us faith-filled responses to your presence in our lives? All over the room, while your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed, you know, we're all in different stories, different chapters of our story right now. But there's a great need for us to trust the goodness and the kindness of God, his favor upon our lives. And to wrestle with the words that have been spoken over our lives. To wrestle with those things that we don't understand. And to take our focus off of what we don't have and to put our focus on the one who is with us. And if the response of your heart today is that of Mary's. Lord, thank you for your favor. 
I don't understand, but I'm available. Be it to me according to your word. If that's the response of your heart, no matter who you are, where you are, what your story is, I just want you to raise both of your hands as a sign of surrender. And literally, like Mary said, I want you to just speak it out loud. I want you to say it to the one who is with you and just say, be it to me according to your word. According to your purpose, O God, let your favor rest upon me. Lord, now let it come. Let faith rise in our hearts. And let a miracle of a heart changed and a life surrendered manifest itself in us today. In Jesus' name.